to kick off by um, congratulating the um, Andrew in particular and the ASA in, in general for um, organizing this symposium. It's a, an extremely um, timely symposium um, in that, as you all know, it's sort of like words and writing have, have always been part of um, architecture culture, but of, of late they've um, it's become a bigger and bigger part of architecture culture, which is the proliferation of texts on architecture. And I suppose the other thing that is more pertinent to a lot of you is that there's a, um, a, um, a growing emphasis on writing within, um, within schools of architecture, and I suppose more interestingly, within um, the studio, within the design studio. Um, so I think it's a very interesting thing to speak about for, um, for half a day, uh, to try and kind of be critical, I suppose, perhaps, of, of the, that growing um, importance being attached to, to architects' writing, um, but also hopefully as well to kind of realize what the potentials and the power writing within the, within the studio are. Um, so Andrew has done a great job in assembling um, people who will hopefully have a lot of interesting things to say um, on, those, on those issues. And the first, um, and then he's divided it into three different um, sections. Uh, the first one being people who, who write about architects why they do that. Um, and then after that, we're going to concentrate more um, um, more closely on, um, on writing within um, schools of architecture. Um, and then after that, we're going to have a look at writing in practice, how, how it might be as useful or otherwise to, um, to, to practitioners. Okay, and then hopefully there'll be time for a 15-minute conversation after each um, session and we'll be um, a break <coughs> so we can get some air and come back uh, reinvigorated. Okay, so to kick off with um, Kevin Donovan from um, UCD, who um, has written for a long time about architecture, but has also just um, embarked on that. Discussion 
a conversation that's often transcribed as notes and then later on becomes the written object of some kind of rationalization. And again, this process is often not commented on knowledge. So there's some kind of gap here to be addressed, but it's not really this gap that I'd like to concentrate my attention on today. Um, I'd like instead to very briefly outline another kind of conceptualization of relations between or potential relations, relations between writing and architecture. It seems true that architects are expected to work in a way that is complex and theoretically and analytically, and writing is a tool of the architect, and writing allows information to be, on the one hand, very clearly codified within its discipline and transmitted in very precise detail to be saved, to be traced, to be proved, to be disproved, etc. But on the other hand, writing allows information to be distressed and discarded and reimagined and turned inside out, radicalized and reversed. And architects are not often encouraged or expected to consider this in terms of their writing. It's as if the paradigm for making architecture very happily marginalizes writing uh, as a tool of record or proof rather than as a tool for creation. And one can imagine even that as architects we are a bit afraid of what writing can do. We are afraid that perhaps writing is beguiling or bewitching or that it will lead us astray somehow. It will lead us astray out of the discipline, out of the things that architecture can call its own, whatever those things might be. And I think there are many reasons for this, many historical and cultural reasons. Um, first, there's a kind of a suspicion that writing is binding or manipulative. Um, we somehow believe, and this is very tenacious belief, I think, that speech is purer than writing and that the communicator in speech literally stands behind his words so that what I'm saying to you now is true simply because I'm saying it rather than because I'm writing it. We might agree to something verbally, but we'd be loath to sign a contract um, to, to that effect. Uh, to put something down in writing is to close it down, <coughs> often for our projects, I think. We might also be suspicious that if we um, own up to an interest in language, as a potential generator in architecture, that we're required to believe that architecture is a language, and then we go down another path. So we believe that the function of language is partly communication, therefore do our buildings have to communicate? Do we have to communicate directly through our buildings? Do we worry that the materiality, or the form, or the use of the building, the things that we're really concerned about, will take second place to the meaning and to be worried that we might become readers of science or statisticians rather than architects. And it's probably the, the prominent culture of language within postmodernism in, in this respect that remains somewhere within our peripheral vision and we're, we're very anxious to avoid its gates. We don't really want to go down the road again. I think to be um, circumscribed, I suppose is the word, by these ideas is to do a disservice to a potentially rich relationship between architecture and writing. And if we're worried about architecture going astray, I think we're in quite a happy position because I think it already has, and I think that they're already. Um, the discipline of architecture uh, sits between two things, roughly speaking. It sits somewhere between the sciences and the humanities. Um, this could be seen to be to its disadvantage that it doesn't really know in, in what arena it's operating. But clearly, um, particularly for architecture students, I think, it's always attractive to work between things rather than within things. It can be liberating, particularly if you know what the within is, or the two withins between which you're working. So I'm going to attempt a kind of a, um, a, a really gross oversimplification of an argument that was made in 1951 by somebody called C.P. Snow, who was a novelist and uh, a theoretician. And uh, he gave a lecture in, in 1951 called The Cultural Divide, which polarizes these two withins, the within of science and the within of humanity. So I'm going to repeat that and then suggest maybe a few ways that we can operate between these. So again, this is a, a 
pretty bad oversimplification. But science, we can understand as being interested in the physical world, and the humanities are maybe concerned more with the cultural world. So if science is looking at a physical world that can be explained, the humanities are uh, interested in reimagining a world of interpretation, so the human project of human culture. Science operates by formulating laws by which the world might be understood, whereas the humanities look more to metaphor rather than laws, to relate things. That is to say that there are more or less persuasive interpretations of how things relate to each other and they can always be calibrated. Where science sees itself as moving ever closer to meaning or some kind of truth or an absolute, an absolute um, the humanities are maybe more interested in participating in a kind of a dialogue, an ongoing thing, a debate. And the debate is the point rather than where you get to in the debate. So again, to closely oversimplify, um, we can suggest that science is interested in problem solving and making sense of things, whereas architecture, <coughs> not architecture, but the humanities try to problemize, problematize things that are understood in common sense. It, it tends not to understand common sense, but to poke around a bit of common sense and to investigate the points where things don't go here, where things don't fit the rule, where they break down, and where there are these things. So even though these are very extreme views of, of those two poles, I think um, it's useful to think, them, to think about them a little bit, because for me, I'm suggesting that architecture is privileged to be in the middle of those two poles. Um, and the sciences and the humanities then make their own arguments, and they make these arguments in writing but the writing in each camp is of a different type. So the theories of science are largely written in terms of proof and disproof and record of things, whereas the arguments of the humanities tend towards the interpretive and the, the metaphorical. Yet, when we try to combine architecture and writing, we tend to appeal to the scientific models. We tend to think, we tend to use architecture in practice as a way of proving things or binding ourselves to things. And though we think of our process as being open-ended and free as architects, or we like to think of it like that, we're, used, we're, we're not used to engaging the open-endedness of writing in the humanities. So I'd like for, I think I'm not about 10 minutes, this minute, for, for the rest of the time, um, I'd like to maybe signal some of the ways in which I'm beginning to take an interest in um, the opportunities that writing outside of the ways we know it in architecture and our cultural method in architecture might help us. So one might be in some kinds of literary devices. Um, for example, uh, in the way literary writing, particularly not the writing of novels, but the types of fiction, differentiates between story and plot. Um, the story is one thing after another, uh, as it happens in reality, in fact it comes. The plot is a way of organising these things so that we can relate to them. Um, it's a way of arranging and presenting things that happen, but not necessarily chronologically. Um, in our current way of thinking, so I suppose we could call it the post-modern way of thinking. Um, we've come to feel that uh, leading people through architecture, and I suppose I'm thinking of uh, something like the architectural promenade or the architect's uh, will to lead uh, a user through the building. We've come to think of this as something that isn't quite as rich as you might previously have been thought, that is perhaps a little too masterful, a little too controlling. And we think now more about metaphors of fields and fluid spaces in architecture, that the piece of architecture exists and then is used somehow. And one could imagine that the art of plotting, which is used very keenly by certain types of writer, writers of literature, um, or the art of a non-prescriptive arrangement of activity within the field, that this could be a useful operation to engage in, whether or not the, 
the architect is designing a building or writing about a project or writing in a project. So I suppose I'm thinking a little bit on, on the edges of, of theory. Um, and I think this, if we're in a forum where we're uh, thinking about writing in architecture, theory is going to inevitably come up. So theory manifests itself in writing. And it allows us to question the assumptions that we make, the common sense assumptions that we make in our approach to written operations. So when we read a novel for pleasure in an offhand kind of way, we assume that the words mean what they say, and we assume that the key to understanding the thing that we're reading is um, knowing what the author means to communicate, that there's an ultimate message or something. I think the invitation in theory comes through writing is to undermine our own assumptions about what it means to make something, to make something written, or to make something built. And I think this is useful, particularly in the fields of architecture and architectural writing, where the intention of the author is still really strong. I think architecture is still very um, authorial, um, or authoritative, I suppose, in the way it presents itself. And I think this model might be a way Um, theory is, I suppose, also suspicious of the assumption that words mean what they say. And there's a branch of analysis that I, I think is very interesting called discourse analysis, which is a process for looking for the messages that are embedded in the linguistic choices made by individuals. So if we can imagine a situation where we compare rather than accept the linguistic choices of people like engineers, architects, politicians, users, journalists and uh, lots of other groups when they write about the same environment or the same product, the same scheme or the same idea from a different perspective, this in itself becomes a creative process. Um, another point, the second last point, is that writing implies reading. And there are certain types of theory, and again I don't want to particularly get get into theory, but I think if we're in this forum, it will inevitably come up. Um, and I'm thinking of certain types of theory in the humanities, something like post-structuralism, for example, offers the idea that the total existence of writing isn't in the work itself, but in something that it calls the text, and the text is much broader than the piece of work. And the text is wide, it's composed of multiple operations, or multiple types of writing. It can be drawn from many cultures, and it's not bound, it's not bound in volume, it's not bound by its place in writing on the shelf of the library or something. It's larger than that, and it's maybe slightly at odds with itself. It isn't resolved, but it's focused in the reader, um, in the interpreter, in the person who needs the text. And if we look at the origin of the word text, um, it shares its origin with words like texture and textile, and this is a established argument I think, in those structures. But what this suggests to me is that the text is made from a continuous overcrossing of elements, that it isn't stable, that it's moving, crossing over itself, and that at certain points there's a reader who can uh, make a thing out of that. Um, so it's performative and it really exists in every region. And this seems to me as if it could be a kind of a definition actually of the way some architects think of their process of creation, when they're in the studio, or whether they're or when they're writing about something. Even those architects who would really shun any association with linguistic analogy uh, at all. <coughs> so the final point then is that I think it's fair to say that an agent, a really important agent for use in architecture is movement. Um, that the simplest and most compelling means of finding our bodily presence in space is movement. Um, by questioning our presence, by moving our presence around, by moving it through an environment. When we move in space, or when we have space move around us, we perceive that the atmosphere is changing all the time, and we connect very strongly with architecture in a mobile kind of way. And we have a model for this in writing. Um, Movement is a, is a constituent factor uh, in language, 
because meaning is always novel. We can never be sure that what we say transmits its meaning. We know that meaning is always dependent on words that aren't said, on the next word in the sentence that you haven't heard yet, on all the words in the dictionary, on all the words uh, that the speaker has ever heard, that the speaker that the listener has ever heard in his or her life. So there are myriad links to other um, pieces of language that are always absent, but somehow kind of expected in the discussion. And the writing would seem to be a fixed thing, because we put it down uh, on a page, or on a screen, or something, in a way that uh, we think it can't easily be moved. It's only fixed within its movement. It has to keep moving to be understood. It's always open to new interpretations uh, for those who are willing to risk those interpretations. So it's an invitation to us, I think, to be a little bit risky. So, I suppose, to conclude, um, one could keep going in this thing for, for a long time. To be brief about it, I think that writing is a means by which architecture can question the assumptions it makes about itself, and it's useful for that. I think writing can be part of the creative process of the architect. I think critical writing in architecture is necessarily creative. Again, to talk about origins of words, crisis and criticism come from the same root. So to criticise something is implicitly to call it into crisis, to not accept it uh, as it is, but to move it somehow. And criticism is mostly done in writing, occurs in writing, but it does not have to be, I think, outside of the architectural process. I think there's a, a way, or there may be ways, in which architects can embrace writing as part of their own continuous critical Thanks very much. Thinking of that wall, um, you might think of what it's made out of, how high it is or how long it is, um, what it feels like, um, what it does, anything about its physical presence that interests you. So now, without talking to anybody, um, I'd like you to um, write that wall. And maybe write three sentences, or most three sentences, or just standalone words, or the start of the story, the start of something about that one. Um, so you might take maybe like three minutes or something.
so um, just as a, an artificial ending point, um, it's a short period of time. You might turn to the person behind you, or if you want to use a dialogue, you need to know the person inside you, the person you know well, and just read them what you wrote.
uh, sometimes when I think of something new, even if it's mid sentence, if it's pressing to start that new sentence, so I'm not working on four sentences at the same time and thinking in that in that kind of way. So um, so I don't lose something. Um, and this can get a bit messy and a bit unwieldy, and it's not like linearly moving through one thought at a moment in time, which is like when you read something that's completely and final at the end. And um, so I draw attention to this um, because it's part of the process which I particularly enjoy. Um, and also, um, if you think of this as a, a design process, um, uh, we're very familiar with the fact that the architectural design process is not something that's linear. And um, so the activity of writing for me is also similar to that. So um, I end up. Um, and anything that I write, lots of bits of half sentences or words left behind, um, or a few sentences that I sort of uh, don't make uh, the cut and I end up having a rate of these pages that these generate at the end of any kind of the document. And it's like these pieces sort of um, have a life somewhere else or need a life somewhere else. Um, so I went back um, on the computer and preparing for this uh, something from 2004 um, and uh, found um, a folder uh, called bits and bits one a document, bits two documents, so this is just some pages out of that and bits, but the leftover bits uh, that there were sort of semi-form thoughts that um, I wouldn't have wanted to throw them out um, on, on the order, but the, the sort of fact that the computer can keep these things in a certain way um, um, without sort of paper. Um, and so in a sort of in a pedagogical sense, I think you could describe this way of approaching writing as a process of inquiry in and for itself. So um, uh, writing is about figuring something out. It's not about writing up a preformed idea. So maybe to take on from the points of Kevin's um, discussion of, of the difference between how writing might be approached in the humanities or um, the scientific model uh, within the space of. Um, I don't necessarily need to read as many books up here because uh, I didn't actually. Uh, but uh, that's fine. Um, um, but. Uh, uh, it, it, sometimes writing can be considered as sort of as held at a distance or you're keeping and you're writing with something at a distance. Uh, but in this kind of sense, I'm drawing writing as a way of um, sort of figuring something out and how the words begin to form themselves around an idea. You end up with lots of stuff like this, um, and, but it can become uh, where that idea can take you. Um, and I think this sense of understanding or thinking of writing as a form of inquiry um, is particularly important to students of architecture um, as another tool in the toolbox within the design process, um, along with the scalpel, along with the pencil, and maybe, um, I don't know, dare I say it, as equal value potentially as, uh, as some of the other design tools that you have. Um, and there may be a fear of starting to write without knowing where it's going, and that's something that is, that's why I'm sort of exposing this uh, side of things here. Um, and so I'm thinking about this, uh, this process is my sketching, so these are the means of my butter paper in the days when there was butter paper used most of the time, or sketching models that don't make the final cut. Um, and this is how I understand myself in the creative activity sort of involved um, in writing. So um, a piece of sentences, or half sentences, or a few sentences together starting to shape these into sequence and allowing them to form their message. Um, that is a very sort of enjoyable construction uh, that I would describe and uh, this manipulation of words, moving back and forth between fragments and deciding whether you want a short sentence or a longer sentence, how that um, sort of uh, makes up um, something that you do end up uh, uh, moving through. So there are lots of sets of decisions to be made um, as well as moving through. Um, and uh, I can consider it as a, as a construction or a journey uh, through words and through thinking the journey that I want to bring others along. Um, so the writing begins as a process of um, inquiry and a process of self-communication with oneself, um, but at some point that uh, writing um, most often ends up as a communication of the material sharing of it, and I think there's a, there's a, there's a moment uh, in between there. Um, and as one moves through sentences, um, hearing them spoken in your head, I guess everybody's different, I've never really spoken to anybody about this, but um, if I'm reading sometimes I know I'm reading fast, faster than the speed of um, speaking, um, and other times we'll be reading um, at the speed with which one might uh, deliver something. So it's interesting to think about that um, in terms of the, the, the rhythm and its coherence in time um, in a passage of writing. So short pauses, long pauses, uh, emphasis, no pauses. Um, and um, in thinking of this pace of the writing as it emerges, you start to think of punctuation not as a burden, uh, but as something that is actually critical uh, to, how you're, um, to how you're writing and how the writing progresses. Um, so in a relationship between sentence length and word length and punctuation, all generating sort of rhythm to the text, uh, there's how this all visually appears in the page. Um, and sentences and their arrangement of the page can make a difference, um, uh, I think. And I was just thinking about this last night, perhaps to an architect um, um, who 
is conversed in the visual world, uh, maybe this becomes more important than a certain uh, way, potentially, or possibly. Um, and the flight of the page is also, um, can also be important. So in thinking about these kind of things, like what might be conceived as the, or considered as the mechanics of writing, um, actually can sort of hugely impact the message or the atmosphere of that message. Um, and for this, and for lots of different reasons, I'm just picking one reason, um, Kevin also mentioned uh, literary writing or literary fiction. Um, but thinking of sort of fiction writers, words and sentences as their sort of, um, and this is what they do, uh, and uh, there, there is nothing else. And it's this care with construction and, and that, uh, that, is, that is important. So an engaging plot or the, the arrangement of the sequence of what is happening in the story can only go so far if it is put together, and well, I think anyway, if it's put together and carefully constructed through words, that's when something starts to really sing, I think. Um, and this craft of, of shaping words. So these are just two extracts of contemporary um, uh, Irish authors, um, I can actually read Oak here. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, a description uh, from Anne Inglis, the gathering of Dunn and Lewis, maybe sometime in the, I can't remember exactly what it was published, maybe five years ago, something like that. Um, a description there was a handball alley in the grounds, and she left us then with bed between its concrete walls. On the rise behind the alley, there was a round tower, like the Irish round tower in a couple of the colours, and beside that was a huge vat of stone, perhaps 100 feet high, and that was a water tower. And they stood watching the hill, like a fat woman and a thin man looking far out over the sea. There it was, at the bottom of the hill, a strong sea under a hard white sky. And we might have run down there, but Ada had charged us to stay put, so we played a little in the handball, like doing nothing, just liking the shape of it and being in it. The back wall and the two slanting side walls, like cutting the end off a shoebox. On one side was the round tower and the water tower, and on the other was a wall of red brick. We did not look at this wall as the dirty casement windows with no bars where the lunatics were. And we did not think of what lunatics did when I saw children eat them, I thought, suck at their ears and gibber. So we played being nice children for the watching movies until Ada came back with her string bag half empty, pleased in a thorough sort of way to see us playing there. So I'm just taking that, uh, just that uh, description of this particular place and uh, sort of something we might describe in the architecture studio or consider like the Animal Valley and how um, sparingly presented it is here, but how um, uh, strikingly special and how strong it is. Uh, um, as, a, as a presence in terms of the words that are described, but um, how, how few words are required here. And so the process of thinking of this as a careful craft was something that, in the first instance, like I just described, but firing things onto the screen and then shaping and figuring it out, then moving into sort of um, a later stage when you start wanting to share that or communicate that with others, and um, how you might uh, work towards, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, I don't want to say that word editing, but um, in this context, but uh, uh, a further shaping of these words. This is um, uh, uh, a section from a um, book um, from the 70s, um, uh, William Zinser on writing well, the classic guide to writing non fiction. So it's kind of a guide in a certain sense, but I, um, uh, in, in certain pragmatic senses, but I just take it for example, this is what he is included within the book um, as a draft of two of the pages of the book and the kind of reworking that might actually happen here. So, you might consider it just as carefully in relation to um, the need or the desire to have um, uh, pieces of paper stuff printed out into a sort of writing room where I see um, um, that everybody maybe does, but it's something that you might become more aware of as part of, part of the activity and what you're doing. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, so, thinking of the questions that um, Andrew set out for discussion. Um, Today, I'm thinking again of the sentence of Shane Lacombs was circulated as part of the email, which um, when he wrote in related to that in verse comes, what matters is work, not words. And my guess is that the, this sentence has been sort of maybe more quoted um, over the years than maybe he originally intended it to be. Um, but uh, it sort of has sort of uh, raised various debates um, over time. And I don't know if anybody else is listening to or to read one on Sunday morning um, and uh, the discussion uh, which you wrote on John Toomey with Mary O'Connor. Um, and uh, uh, there was a discussion where she uh, started discussing, um, and I, I didn't go back to find the exact quotation, but she was talking about words and the importance of uh, words in their practice and um, in generating an image that they can then work with and respond to through design. And it was part of the discussion. And um, for two years, I spent just when I graduated with Grafton Architects, and then considered 
and the, uh, the graph in our graph is also has a relationship where it's maybe worth acting as metaphors in a certain kind of way, but also holding and, and generating and, and being part of um, uh, particular design concepts and spatial concepts. Um, and it could be said for both these practices that were part of their um, uh, critical um, uh, and creative uh, design process. But going further and um, beyond this, uh, I think there's um, sort of a tremendous variety of ways in which writing can operate with an architecture. Yes, there can certainly be writing about architecture, so that is the reverse, the words about the work. And yes, there can be individual uh, words in relation to spatial concept and images, um, like I just mentioned, but there also can be writing architecture, writing spatially, um, and writing propositionally and spatially together. Um, and so involving writing more closely in the design activity of the discipline of architecture needs to embrace this multiplicity or this openness. So um, again, in the sort of the blurb setting up today, I'm sorry to quote you a few times, but I think it was, it was useful as a starting point thinking about this. And uh, the, the Society of Architecture have drawn attention to this increasing emphasis on theoretical research in schools of architecture <coughs> and the need for um, maybe this idea of theoretically backing up the design process. And in response to this, I don't think the role of writing with an architecture or of writing architecture should be confined to um, uh, necessarily rationalising or discussing what one is doing as a designer. Um, and certainly not a sense of backing up something. So this is a, this is a subjective answer in, in a way. <coughs> Um, and a text that is theoretical, that clearly is going on a whole set of reading and understanding of other positions and, and, uh, uh, and debates and discourses and approaches to certain topics doesn't have to be written in a particular one particular kind of way, in a, um, in a defensive kind of way, is, was one way um, it, it could be considered. Um, and in itself, it doesn't need to be um, censored as a support or as a backing up. And, and through the method of this writing, it can be formed this idea of engaging theory as a process of inquiry. Um, autonomous in itself in relation to the um, architectural project, but nonetheless uh, central to it, can be provocative and speculative in considering uh, theory. Um, and it, it feels more appropriate to consider this process of writing as an opening up, so rather than something that you're being asked to do or have to do, um, but that is something that um, uh, is, uh, is, is part of your process. Um, and, and I think, sort of, uh, within the practice of architecture, writing has a very uh, potent and exciting potential. And, and more to the, the, the questions that the also are asked um, in the provocation for today. How can writing help to clarify design intention and to what extent can it aid as a design tool? And how, to know, how can theoretical explorations become creatively involved in the architectural project? And so, um, just with some of the, yeah, just uh, five minutes just to present um, uh, some, a few short extracts um, of the work from current filters and so on. So, um, just, just very briefly, um, including writing within um, sort of the teaching that I've been involved in at the beginning with uh, Beth Chapman and Marcus Hanley in UCD for a few years ago, um, and now in Seoul for um, six years now, um, involved in sort of small uh, uh, writing tasks within the design studio that our writer will be discussing later, and um, might remember from the first year, um, and then pushing that uh, through now to mostly working with with fifth year and as well as first and second year. So you feel that there's a sense of potential uh, within the design process. Um, and it's all writing in a formal sense that's involved in every single year, mostly within uh, the history and theory module, uh, where essays are written every semester. Um, and then in the fourth and fifth year, there are advanced theory electives. Um, sorry, I should mention there's the dissertation, which is now bridging the second and third year, and um, run by Irene Scalber. Um, and because uh, these were teaching in the first year, coming from the Columbia. Um, and then uh, advanced electives, and two in particular, I think, have a big impact on the nature of writing within the School of Architecture Number One, um, taught by Lyle Shaw. Um, um, his two electives, Radical Description is one title, and Experimental Research is another, so involving uh, writing in particular kinds of ways and reading it in a breadth uh, far beyond the discipline of architecture. And he's a professor of English at New York University. And the other person is Tom Moylan, who's a professor of utopian studies and uh, offers a module on utopian studies. So this activity of writing by the time um, students come to fifth year uh, are, is well involved within the process of, of the learning of architecture. So it's not something uh, deemed separate, I would think. But maybe Marianne will offer something, uh, something different. So proceeding from a relatively large piece of work in third year through a relatively large piece of work in fourth and fifth year. Um, so, uh, sort of, the, the few pieces that I'll show here are sort of the building up of that kind of work. And in fifth year, at the start of fifth year, students are asked to present their interests through model, through writing, um, uh, through drawing, in, in a very broad way. There's no kind of, there's no limitation whatsoever um, put on those ideas. 
um, and uh, writing is encouraged to expand and to explore sets and setting a broad context for uh, the architectural exploration um, of the thesis. So um, I am teaching in fifth year along with Mary Kukos and Peter Carroll um, and through the involvement in writing and particularly uh, falls to me or, or I, gener I generate it so because I enjoy it uh, so much but, um, and I see the impact it makes I suppose um, and I leave it to Mary to discuss that particularly later but the dynamic in terms of what is produced changes every year you can see it in the school developing and now with the fourth year or fifth years now basically so just to present uh, four different sort of ways of current fifth years who are um uh, there's a review today actually that um, and, and we're seeing in terms of seeing actually a project started to emerge in the site but these pieces of work um emerging earlier so um the first is a piece uh, by uh, just an extract from claire o'callaghan's thesis and she has invented um her interest, anyway, for her thesis is about uh, is to do with materiality, the reuse of, reuse of materials, and a different attitude to materiality, um, and how deconstruction um, in the in the construction of the building, deconstruction is equally a, a part of the concept of what might actually happen uh, in the future. So she's invented it through her writing. She's read copiously, and um, but the, the in theory, but the writing does not sort of explicitly um, expose those kinds of discussions. It's embedded within. Um, and it's, it's visible in that way. So she invented this new city of the future, and she, as an architect, takes a visit to this new city of the future. The time is unknown. And the citizens are called um, dead horse, uh, related to a different uh, architectural conversation. Um, and so she's describing uh, uh, an observation of this new city. She says, a small building no more than 30 square meters in the ground, constructed by the dead and the people of this new city itself, underwent deconstruction during the visit. It was extraordinary to witness. Initially, a large pit was dug to the east, um, where a small patch of uncapped land lay on the periphery of the lot. The loose soil from the excavation was then transferred to a wheelbarrow to the interior of space of the building, left in large amounts and tossed occasionally by those inside. One of the slighter in diagonal a young man, not, not long out of his teens, then squeezed into the wall through the small door provided at the south end of the edges. The other stood well clear, suspended in the expected to love. For a few long moments, nothing happened. A woman walking a rather yappy Jack Russell paused in anticipation on the opposite pavement. The jacket sounded metal upon metal echoed around the large cavity. Inside, he slowly sat at the cords. Long thin panels of precast concrete began falling with no apparent urgency towards the soft area mounds of soil at their toes. The fresh, detossed earth cushions their fall and the panels remained undamaged, save for a few superficial chips at the edges. Over the next few hours, the moment scrapped from the rafters and partitions was thrown into the pit and lid. Once an adequate temperature was reached, the screws and nails and iron were smelted and the tools and scaffolding joints for the next job were made. Re-evaluating the distinction between two and two and materials drastically altered the manner in which the new system could construct. Robert Smithson in his essay on sedimentation of the modern earth project writes, even those the most advanced tools and machines are made of the raw matter of the earth. This is acknowledged and raised. So the fact is, um, it's a discussion we have to have, but the fact that she's included sort of a direct quotation there, in some ways, is a discussion we have, but it's actually necessary, and in some ways, I think that could pull out. But um, the, the sort of the, like she, in some ways, I could describe she has designed the project through words, and um, this is just one short extract, and uh, it has yet to come through in the drawings and, and the models, uh, but it's all part of the piece um, in terms of uh, project on the site. Um, but the project is there. Just offering um, an, another student, just briefly, an approach in the engaging images of the city in relation to short uh, pieces of words. This, this is writing, um, uh, just as equally, but a different kind of a way of approaching it, a different method, <coughs> and the sequence of, um, of a photo essay describing this. This is a, another student, uh, Ben Mullen, who, um, uh, in terms of thinking about an idea of uh, linking creative writing uh, with um, critical writing, these are um, uh, an appendix, or he has started, or, or a glossary, um, um, in, in a way of uh, pulling apart certain words that he has come across through his reading and adding to his own observations. So um, you probably can't actually uh, read it as I hear, but I'm uh, hoping that uh, there is a lot from here, but I don't know. Um, uh, so it, this is sort of a set of, he has a set of maybe six different parallel texts that are working, not, not only for an overall essay or an overall piece, but things that are working parallel to each other. And, and, and then uh, uh, just to consider the last, uh, the last piece, just as an example, um, uh, uh, one of the, it, it is important in this context, I should mention, he's a mature student, uh, maybe, I don't know, actually, maybe in his late 40s. Um, 
uh, who had uh, originally from Glasgow and uh, has involved memoir within his uh, within his text um, that's related to the, the way his architectural thesis project is developing. So um, he initially um, learned to lay bricks in Glasgow who, um, had, and then uh, travelled to Africa and spent many years uh, teaching that skill to uh, people there and now is studying architecture. So this context in, uh, is important. So um, I will read this because I think it's a question. Uh, I think I'm going to I stop. Okay, I'll stop that. And there's no coming back. 
Um, so it's always a middle reader, but that means also then it has to be written in a way that the reader will, you know, I mean, if, if you've got, no matter what it is, I think, if you can't explain it uh, in the way that you would explain something to your mom or your dad, um, then you haven't boiled the thing down hard enough, in my view. I think there's no room for jargon in writing at all. Um, I think, you know, everybody, everybody shares the same language, everybody speaks and people speak at different levels, I suppose. But um, there's nothing to be ashamed of writing simply and clearly. I mean, if you, 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 you can explain anything if you boil it down without having to use uh, special words, I think. But then, I mean, when I think about it, and the reader, why do I write? I don't write for the reader. Um, I write for myself. Um, there are three real reasons, I suppose, uh, three words that kind of uh, occurred to me when I was thinking about why I write. One is culture, one is curiosity, and one is conversation. And they're in no particular order, but uh, I guess by culture what I would mean is, is the field of architecture. Um, uh, I guess about curiosity, it's, it's about me. It's what makes me tick to do the thing. And a conversation is, is the reader. It's where, where does it go from there? But thinking about uh, culture, and that is a motivation, always has been a motivation for me to, uh, to write. And the reason for that uh, goes back very early, I mean, certainly in my student days, um, when you would pick up, you know, it's different today, but then when you would pick up um, surveys of architectural history of the 20th century um, and you'd spin into the index of the back. There was never an entry for Ireland. There was never an entry for Dublin. There was never an entry for Irish architect. It was, a, it was just a blank. There was no history. There was no, uh, there was no architectural culture. Um, it's a funny thing. If, 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 if buildings and if architecture is not written about, it doesn't exist. It really doesn't exist. So in a way, I mean, the journalism, which is the area where I've, I've operated most uh, and am most comfortable, um, is often described as a first draft of history. So it ties into that idea. I mean, I work today more as a historian than as anything else, a um, historian of, of modern architecture. And um, a historian, uh, when, when he or she is approaching uh, a building of 50 or 60 years ago, the first thing you do is you go to see what were the contemporary accounts. If there are no contemporary accounts, it makes it, it, it is actually much more difficult to build the status of the the object or the building that you're writing about. Um, and those great weight is placed on those uh, contemporary accounts. Um, you can revise them, of course, and there are different opinions uh, emerging, different readings are possible uh, over time. But the, the, the contemporary accounts are very important. So in a way, when you are writing about architecture, you're completing the project. It's actually part of the architectural project. The architect gets to do it to a certain stage and hands it over to people, hands it over to society. And at that point, the critic completes the work. The critic writes about the work, opens the conversation with society. Um, so it's, it's, part of, it's part of the architectural project. The work of architecture is not complete until it has been written about. I mean, most architects are happy but once the photograph is taken, that's it. The, the photograph is, is the permanent record. It's just a visual thing. That's because, I mean, the way architects tend to read books too is just by reading the images and not the words. But uh, in the deeper, in the deeper uh, part of, of what we do, the, the writing is very important as well. So um, I think that's interesting. And I think that um, the architects, uh, you know, it's, when, when I would go to, when you, I would go to write about anything, uh, just as you would, you know, I do my research first. And uh, so research typically for you on a project that maybe is well known will involve going to the library and, and, you know, finding the drawings, finding texts about that particular project or whatever. 
when you're writing about something completely new, maybe something that has never been written about before, it's the first time to imagine the research takes place usually with the architects. Uh, and that's, that's a very interesting, that's a hugely enjoyable thing, you know, because it's, it's, it's the best sort of gossip, you know, when we just talk about why you did things or why things are the way they are and that form of interrogation. And the best results come from a very open uh, conversation. I find the best architects are extremely open, um, will often um, not seek to protect a vulnerability that they may feel about a project. I mean, for example, um, uh, the Gail Lawrence building by Don and Toomey. Um, I was the first to write about that, and uh, at the time, I know John was saying that he wasn't really sure that you know his face was ready yet. That, he, that, that, that there, there was there was there was an amount of thinking about how he was designing a non-facade facade. And he wasn't sure if he had got it right or got them yet. And yet that conversation would be entirely open. And with the best architects, it always is. Um, and then you go and you stalk the woman like a hunter, um, take a long time, or walk around it maybe several times um, before going in. And you know, the conversation, first of all, whether you go with or without the architect, it doesn't is, is immaterial to me at that stage and since the research and the conversation has been had you then have to trust your eyes and that takes time I don't ever bring a camera um, I don't use a camera anymore uh, because I found that using a camera only postponed the act of looking um, that it's much better to um, just start slowly to absorb the atmosphere um, and to just you know dream a little bit in, 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 in the building, make your notes, and come away and think about it. And writing might take place sometime afterwards. Uh, for me, writing is a very painful business. Um, it is really a horrible thing. It's particularly horrible trying to start. Um, uh, you don't know where you're going. Um, it's a complete uh, surprise and a mystery. Um, at the end, it's always quite incredible um, that she just I, I had no idea that this is what I thought about something. It's, the writing is, um, it's about finding out uh, what you actually think about something. You have been, I only write about things that I have a hunch will be interesting, you know, things that will, will tickle my fancy um, because otherwise, well, you know, it's just a dull business, there's not much point. Um, but it's discovering something new, discovering something you never really knew about architecture before through writing it. Um, the writing for me is not continuous. Um, it's usually best done at night. Um, can't really write during the day at all. Very often I find um, when I get stuck that it's good to go to bed for an hour uh, and get up and somehow you dream your way out of the problem. Um, and you can move on to the next, uh, the next uh, part of it. Um, I interviewed Boris Craig, who was maybe the finest writer of the 20th century in Ireland on, on architecture, a uh, wonderful stylist, uh, towards the end of his life, and he said to me that uh, he found writing was a painful business and he didn't do it if he, he avoided it if he possibly could. Um, his way of writing was um, to walk um, and to assemble sentences, which he would roll verbally, you know, you know roll the sounds of them, um, and until the sentence sounded right, he didn't commit anything to pick up, and then he would do the same thing with the next sentence. So that sound and rhythm that we've heard about earlier, I think, is is very important. Um, and eventually, if you write enough, eventually uh, there comes a moment when I think you find your own voice. That's the hardest thing, that's what you're really looking for. Um, because until, until you find your own voice, you, you, you don't have that confidence about, uh, in, in, in what you're doing. So um, that, that takes time, that takes a long time. And then I guess conversation, so curiosity and culture, those are the two things. When, when you are actually part of the culture, you're completing, you're completing that first. You're, you're, <coughs> In a way, you're kind of 
christening the baby, if the architect has had the baby, you're kind of giving it a name. Um, I think that's what you do at that stage. Um, and then the conversation is, well, you hope when you put it out there uh, that it uh, strikes some chords, some resonances. Um, with, I know I know from feedback that it does, you know, with ordinary people, um, with builders, get excited about things, with architects who come back to you and say, I'm not quite sure, you know, uh, that I agree with you on your interpretation of this or that. Um, so it becomes part of a feedback. Ideally, the best writer becomes, or contemporary work becomes a part of a feedback loop uh, with the originators of the work. I guess that's why I think.
first thing when you wake up this morning, in the morning. I think it's interesting when you say, Shane, I'm about to go to bed for a while and then waking up, because I actually did this last night. <laughs> it's yeah. actually not, it's too tired to go home and try to play this. So sometimes that is actually really something you feel like a different and think about first place somehow, or walking. So that, you, so that you might sort of think of ways where other people will wake up in the morning and just start to wake up um, uh, without uh, sort of starting the day. So you might sort of think about that maybe continue that. Or else all of you are probably involved in this nice new really project. So it's just to sort of say maybe you take an aspect of that and or the wall of that and just start to focus. Because sometimes this, this thing of starting this is really is kind of painful. Um, but once you start, so you all have already started something. Uh, so to continue that, that was the that was that was the reason that it's just a so easy to sort of artificially that was an artificial moment of starting something in order to then but it's just as easy to set them for yourselves with your own projects. Because often Or is the interest in the project 
principles most of and it's not necessarily writing about the, their work and there is debate and, and it often happens in terms of time pressures and people drag this on mainly the work that should happen in the first semester is sort of this astonishing sort of broad scope of analysis um, and when it's brought into the second semester when the main emphasis is on output through the architectural project it can become a challenge and then there's discussion of why is it still writing and why is it still writing and I start to feel personally responsible for that whereas you know we set up the thing so it is a tension it can be a tension but for sure, I can say, and maybe you know, we'd be doing the good in some ways, and just by the architectural project, there's huge benefit from it. But I think the architectural project maybe, in fact, uh, uh, you know, like you said, but maybe in the recognition necessary, yes, that the architecture is a very fine tuning of everything, the, the actual anthropological space of the project, but the, the, the intent and the scope of the project is far beyond what the architecture can arrive at. Yeah, so just on, on that point, again, um, an example of that that I was involved in is the, uh, the final year in court from the master's book, where they do uh, um, two semesters and um, produce a thesis project without doing uh, any writing necessarily, but just some students writing this project for creative projects that they, they, they choose for the team and all that. And then they have a third semester that's called Disseminating. Thank you. 